uh, good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see you all. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with Abe because we're going to have a chance to talk. We've had the great pleasure of working together uh, off and on going back about 15 years. But um, I thought maybe we'd start it off. I'm going to do just a quick run through of selects from the New York Times Magazine's work with an emphasis on projects that involved working with artists. You know, I don't like to use labels because one of the things I believe in at the magazine is that blurring of boundaries, having the documentarian do something that, you know, maybe not a classic documentary project or having an artist work on a documentary story that they might not have chosen themselves. So I just wanted to say that right at the outset, but for today's talk, it just seemed to make sense to just kind of narrow down and go quickly through different things in the magazine's recent history that involved that collaborative process where an artist, not a, a person who's regularly shooting for magazines, connects with us and we, we collaborate on something. Um, I just will start with the, um, the cover. Oh, that's a good idea, so it's a little darker. I'll go ahead as, as we do that. This is the cover of this weekend's magazine, and I just thought it would be fun to show. It's a cover story on Cuba, and this was an unusual situation where we didn't assign it. it w the real world intervened. We applied for a visa with the Cuban government months before, and despite repeated tries, we were unable to actually get a visa. They turned us down, and we got very lucky that Stacy Baker, who I work with, realized that Andrew Moore had is coming out with a book this fall of his 10-year body of work in Cuba, including a whole bunch of recent pictures that had never been published that he had done in January of this year. So there's really no moral to this other than good fortune that we were lucky enough that he'd had these stunning pictures. So I also wanted to mention it not knowing how many artists are here today and photographers, but just as a reminder, that's partly why we're just keen on always knowing what's coming up, who's got an interesting project, because sometimes we can somehow connect on a timely fashion with that. And of course, I think this is a spectacular cover, one of our nicest ones in, in ages. You know, magazines are about reinvention. It's about 52 times a year reinventing ourselves, coming up with new ways to tell familiar stories, coming up with unfamiliar stories sometimes, and obviously always trying to figure out visually how to make it dynamic. And what I love about the New York Times Magazine is we've got the latitude to work with all kinds of photographers on every level. So this is work that's done by Olivia B. Cover story shot for us, she was 17 years old. She's a terrifically talented up and comer. She's already been photographing several years. The cover story in this case was about how do you teach sex education to kids today. She did beautiful series of intimate pictures and fun. But I love the fact that in a same year you might see a cover by Araki. And when we had this cover story coming up on Murakami, we called Rocky and he said, sure, he'd love to do it. We had this great portrait. So I like that a magazine, why not? Why not have that range from the legendary to the, to the up and comers? This was just a recent cover story that I thought was terrific. It's classic magazine photojournalism on one level, major story, historically important, Second Avenue subway being built in Manhattan. They talked about doing it for decades. It's finally happening. And this was an idea that I pitched because I thought, God, it's gotta be spectacular underground. They're 10 stories down. Just think about it. You know as soon as you get a photographer in there, it's going to be otherworldly. So I think it's always a, a great to be constantly trying to find, or it's not so easy to find, that big epic story. This, this construction will go on for several years. They blast, blow out the rock, they move forward, they build a certain section, they blast, they blow out the next section. And I commissioned Richard Barnes. So he went into it, not with a 35 millimeter camera, not with a classic sort of, documentary approach, but with a camera on the tripod, making a larger format picture that just renders more detail and all. Limits you in terms of the workers and the movement, but delivers so much in terms of the landscape. And I just love it. I think it was a, a beautiful feature. Again, I'm doing the shortcut version here. There's a whole photo essay with this inside the magazine. Next up again, here we have, this was a is the building. We uh, published it on the anniversary, September 11. It's the rebuilding of the uh, World Trade Center site. And in this case, this is a story, just uh, to give you background, on the importance of just a kind of persistent, obsessive pursuit of something. Joanna Milter, the deputy photo editor at the magazine, 
really, really was keen on getting access to this. She started a year before. She met with the Port Authority guys, went down on the site, and said, you know, the real story is the iron workers. They're the most interesting part. And it took months and months and months of negotiation, and she got the access for Damon Winter, a great New York Times staff photographer on the paper, to go up with the iron workers, many stories up, and he delivered a beautiful, classic documentary photo essay with a very, he has a very graceful, artistic eye. And I just love it because I know that without that photo editor, Joanna, working it, we might never have gotten him there. So I partly say that because I think people forget with the magazine, sometimes half of it's the access. I'm not, it's not diminishing the artistry at all. Of course, you have nothing unless you have the great artist eye photographer making the pictures, but you got to get there first. People wonder where do the ideas come from. We have a weekly ideas meeting where we meet with the editor of the magazine and go over upcoming photo assignments. And we regularly meet to, to brainstorm covers. Like the biggest, most collaborative thing we do is the cover story. And Rem Duplass is the design director, Hugo Lindgren, the editor in chief, me, some of the art photo people we meet and we just toss out ideas. This was a story coming up on the great tennis legends. It was pegged to last year's US Open. And Hugo had the idea, he said, why don't we, instead of photographing them, we all know what they look like, Bjorn Borg and McEnroe and uh, Agassi, Sampras, all of them, he said, why don't we get actors to play them? Which seemed like a crazy idea, oh my god, how are we gonna do it? But we started, we put out a casting call, came up with who we wanted. We couldn't get any actresses. In the end, we couldn't get the actresses to come on board for this, but right from the beginning, Andy Samberg was said, I, I love it, I'll do it. So then we thought, you know what? Why don't we have him play everybody? So, uh, oh, uh, although we, we ultimately went with just the male players, and I th sometimes we think maybe we should have had him do some of the women too. But he did the male players, and he was absolutely brilliant. It was crazy because he would go into the hair and makeup room. We, hired, we, we booked, at his suggestion, which made sense, the Saturday Night Live team that normally do him, and they were unbelievable. Five minutes, 10 minutes later, I'm not exaggerating, he would come out as a different character. So he comes out as, as McEnroe, and then we'd shoot, and he'd come out, like, unbelievable, just instantly come out, and he'd be Bjorn Borg. Now, I'm gonna just back up, because setting out to do this, realizing we would be parodying to some extent, other images in the past, I was struggling, like from a photo editing point of view, who do you get to do this? On the one hand, we know we need to look closely at the pictures to make them real and funny and have the thing transcend and have it come across. And we started doing research. Stacy Baker, who I work with, got in a bunch of magazines from eBay, Old Sports Illustrated, and when she opened up the issue with this famous uh, match where McEnroe threw the fissy, hissy fit, I looked at it and I saw the byline was Walter Yost, the legendary sports photographer. He just celebrated his 50th year at SI shooting for them because he did his first picture when he was a teenager. And I thought, oh my God, it's obvious, the answer, Walter Yost. He can't shoot sports for anybody else because he's on contract with SI, but we were able to describe this. He was not as sports, but as something <laughs> else. So since it, was, since it was an actor, they were okay with it. And I just loved it because, you know, I, when I called him up and described the project, he said, I would love to do it. He said, I was obsessed with Bjorn Borg. When my first son was born, I wanted to name him Bjorn, and my father said, oh, you can't do that. So I named him Christian Bjorn, and he said, when my second son was born, I named him Bjorn. I figured, <laughs> why not? And then he said, years later, he met Bjorn Borg at, I don't know, the island or something where he was on vacation, and he introduced his sons, Christian Bjorn and Bjorn. <laughs> anyway. I'm just, I, I particularly love it because it's hard to do humor, so just, as a, you know, that's a tough one to pull off on a weekly magazine, and humor and photography is, is a tougher fit sometimes. Then, okay, this year I had the great pleasure of working on a photo issue. Comes up once in a while, Hugo Lindgren, the editor, said we were gonna do a big thing on London, why not make it a photo issue? And I was able to just brainstorm, come up with things, and we're gonna come back to this, because the original first time we ever had a photo issue was the Times Square issue that Abe and I are going to talk about 15 years ago. It was a huge moment, I think, for me personally in the magazine, and we'll get back to that. But this was this year. And what I love about a moment like this and why I think it's particularly interesting today at the art show is it was a case where right away I thought, okay, we're going to have a chance to work with 
somebody who maybe it's harder to find that fit in a news magazine like ours, a Newsweekly. I mean, we're not strictly a Newsweekly, but everything we do has some kind of newsworthiness factor. I had been dying to work with Idris Khan for about five or six years. I literally had a small picture of his up in my office just tacked up like a tear sheet to re just to keep him on my radar screen. Because remember, the decisions we make at the magazine are made at top speed, constantly on deadline. So you, you don't want to lose a thought. Like sometimes if you're just, it's a crazy combination what we do of immediate practical problem solving, how to get something done. But of course, the most important part is how do you keep that creative field open? How do you make sure that when you're under the gun, you're, you're thinking straight? And I thought, oh my God, this is great. We can, this is the moment to call Idris because maybe somehow he can address the landmarks, the cliches, the things that are famous uh, about London. And when I called him, he was totally game. And what he did was he went and he basically searched around all of the um, uh, internet for images of the famous landmarks, whether it was London Bridge or the Tower or the, the London Eye. And he shopped at all the different postcard stores in the city, layered them together. Each image consists of about 50 or 70 images layered together. Of course, it's wonderful because this is a reminder of all the incredible new territory there is with the internet and digital imaging, that there's entire worlds of art to be made now working with that. He would often use just sections. I mean, clearly it's his, his paintbrushes, this kind of digital ability to manipulate and maneuver. And I was just thrilled with what he did and really happy to be at this amazing magazine where the editor would put that picture you just saw on the cover being so kind of abstract and atmospheric. This is just an image or two that I wanted to show. This was earlier work he had done where he took the scores for a piece of music and layered them. And I just loved these pieces. And another inspiration was when he took all like the water towers of the Beckers and layered them. So that was just to back up and give you a sense of the inspiration that led me to think of Idris for this. And then just again with this quick overview, this is the work of Mark Neville, a photographer I hadn't known until doing research for the issue and um, just reaching out to people for suggestions and uh, photographer's gallery suggested Brett Rogers there, who's a terrific director at the gallery. When I said to her, is there any English photographers London based that you think I should be aware of? She suggested him and he did a beautiful thing on all the different subcultures. And then here, this was, you know, uh, often in the magazine, you'll see there's a big mix. So if there's a, a kind of documentary story, maybe there will be a studio story, maybe there's something high concept where we create it. This was working with Nadav Kander to do the Broadway, uh, not the Broadway, the, th the theater actors in London at that moment. And Clinton Cargill, one of the picture editors, suggested this particular story, let's do the theater actors. And I said, let's have Nadav do it because that would be a nice counterbalance than the kind of crisp, sharp uh, portraiture that he does with the other kind of work that you just saw, the more documentary. And then this was the idea of the photographer, Gareth McConnell, when I called him. I said, do you have a thought of something we could do? You know, we're always eager for ideas. It's a hungry, hungry beast. And he said, you know, I, I want to do new models who come to London to make their career, find their fortune. And he said, you know, they come from all over the world. And it was a terrific idea for us because we touched on several things then. Immigration, uh, style world, and it was terrific. And he did a whole series. We did a bunch of research then of 10, 12, I forget how many models from many different countries. Beautiful set of pictures. I'm gonna, it's another thing I would just wanted to mention why the working with artists is always so cool because they, they're constantly mining their own territory. You know, they've got their own obsessions, their own worlds they live in, which tend to be insular sometimes, but that's a good thing. Like if I can harness that to our needs, which tend to be this kind of large public constantly feeding off the news, it's magic can kind of happen. And maybe we'll come back to that with Abe. I wanted to show something from our look section. As some of you probably know, it's a, a weekly section that started about two years ago with our redesign. It's dedicated to photography and it's often one double truck picture introduced by the intro. And this was a great case where Mazimo Vitali, wonderful artist, said to, when I said to him, do you have an idea for the look section? We're always looking for ideas for that if any of the photographers here today have any. And he said, um, there's this great place, the Pulpit Rock in Norway, he'd always wanted to go to, so we sent him. And clearly kind of extraordinary. 
this was a look photo, one of my favorites. It's Atlantic City, one of the last holdouts who wouldn't sell to the casinos. And this one was a fallout from a, a story, a, a written piece. We ultimately didn't publish the piece. I can't remember the reasons why, but we loved this picture so much. We were able to recoup it. But what I like about it, okay, it's funny enough that you have this little house and you have this big casino, but that's not why it's a great picture. Why is it a great picture? Because of that extraordinary cloud activity and the fact that Richard Barnes was able to see that and then heighten this kind of surreal, hyper-real quality of it. I just couldn't get over it. It's so perfect. This is completely real, undigitally manipulated, and just the perfection of what's happening there and the weirdness of it that when I went on vacation on the Jersey Shore last year, I had to go see it for myself. So I literally brought the issue. This is it. Yeah, anyway. But also, like, you can take a look. It's not so interesting until it's seen by a great artist. But Don't, don't quit your day job. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> so true. So true. Uh, and this is Tierney Guerin, who's a terrific, again, artist. And she brought this to us. It's her ongoing project. And of course, we always love that, too, if you've got something in the works and we can get an early peek and even publish before it's completed, that's fine with us. I mean, we understand often an artist wants to finish what they're doing first, but she's doing this series where she builds these plexiglass shapes and then has, it's usually her kids, but occasionally other children pose inside them. So this one was a little bit really quirky for us for the look section, but we just thought it was wonderful. Then this is, uh, we did a cover story on MIA last year, uh, two years ago, and Ryan McGinley did the pictures for us. He's also had an ongoing relationship with the magazine. We've worked together closely on many things. Terrific, terrific artist. And what I love about this, for me what's interesting is it's about the ambition of it. It's thinking big. When I talked to him, what would you want to do? He said, you know, I've always had this idea in my mind of somebody swinging. I like the idea of her swinging, but not in a landscape that you normally see a swing in. Clearly, that picture has been made a lot. I want her swinging against a New York skyline. And then he does an enormous amount of research. You know, in this day and age with the internet, photographers have a responsibility. Like, if you're going to make an image in your mind's eye, you need to take a look at what's out there to make sure you don't repeat it, because lots of things get done again and again, and to somehow figure out the history visually so that you're adding to it. So he looked at lots and lots of pictures of people on swings, and then we set about scouting, found a building 30 stories up that had just been renovated. We were the first people to use it as a location. And of course, for me, the whole time my worry was people will think it was done in the computer, and then it's no fun. It takes all the gas out of it. So we ran a picture on the table of contents from the making of the shoot, which I thought would at least help to show that this is the real thing. And here you see the actual shoot, which is really quite extraordinary. Uh, she came, we hired these special effects guys. And yes, this is a big budget thing. We don't normally spend, you know, go, yeah, I mean, listen, we do on special things. I just, people sometimes say, oh my God, how do you have that much budget? Once in a while for something we think we really can pull it off, we do. But it was the scariest day in my career because I walked up and to the roof and got there before she arrived to see Ryan himself on the swing testing it out. Whenever he asks a subject to jump off a roof or do something to, for one of his pictures, he tests it first. However, when he was testing it out, the truss was a couple inches closer to the edge, and I went and I looked up, and he was flying like this. He was totally harnessed in, but I went to the edge to double check and thinking, okay, maybe it's an optical illusion. So I went like this, and sure enough, he was like this. It was terrifying. So I made the guys move the whole thing back a foot. So when she's actually doing it, she, as she's swinging, it, she would, if God forbid she fell, would just be to the rooftop. I mean, again, double harnessed in, but still. Just, anyway, I just loved it. And I also love, this one is so much about what creative people will do for each other. This was not easy for her to do, for MIA to do. And honestly, after about a half hour of swinging, she had to take a break and she vomited. But she, want, she knew <laughs> the picture he wanted to get. And I love, creative people will do so much for somebody else's creative dream. And then just quickly to show, it's wonderful, wonderful, as we'll see talking with Abe, to have a history with a photographer. And Ryan has worked on a number of things for us. This was the Olympics, uh, two Olympics back, the summer ones with um, Phelps on the cover. And then four years later, we had him do the Winter Olympics. And this one, Jerry Marzorati was the editor of the magazine at that time. And he said, one of the things I love about the winter sports is they often involve, involve the athlete being up in the air. It was fabulous. 
sometimes if you can nail a concept in one sentence or three or four words, it's so helpful because that notion up in the air said to me, okay, Ryan McGinley, and then you know we'd set off, and it's a fun one in terms of the blurring of like the, the boundaries in the different disciplines, and I say that because in talking with Ryan, he said, you know, I, I'd love to control what they wear, because if they're wearing all their usual sports gear, it's gonna be hard to make great art pictures. So we tweaked the reality a bit, and commissioned Rodarte, the wonderful clothing designers, to actually create things for the athletes to wear. So it was a great fashion, because they're top-notch designers, meets art, McGinley meets sports, the greatest athletes in the world. So I just love that, when you can bring these things together. And then I just wanted to show this cover by Nan Golden a number of years ago. I think it was in 96. She's a hero of mine on every level. Her ability to see, to make great pictures, to touch the subject, to deliver something emotionally. It, it was a major moment, just again, to give a sense of history for me personally, because thinking when we had this cover story, it was not a photo essay, but a full reported piece. When this cover story came up, on this 16-year-old model. The whole idea was to tell the story of the temptations, what it's like to, as the high fashion models get younger and younger to throw them into this world really meant for adults. And I was trying to think who could bring something to it and just had one of those great moments thinking of Nan and she did an incredible job. Why? She relates to the themes of this story, the youth, the innocence, the temptation. So she's somebody that, I, first of all, I don't think people realize they know she's a great artist, but I don't think people realize she's a great reporter too. Like she really found out things about James King, this model, that honestly it was amazing. Her ability to read her and understand her character. But you also, like part of being a photo editor, you have to kind of know your artist when you work with an artist because they, they, don't, they come with a different set of things they're looking for in the world or needs or criteria. Like, you don't call Nan to photograph somebody she doesn't like. Like, she has to connect with the subject. And that's fair enough. Like, I know her, her, her artistry well enough to know that. Meaning you wouldn't have Nan follow a politician or you wouldn't have her do someone that she just doesn't relate to their worldview. Romney, exactly. You wouldn't assign her to Romney. It's just not gonna get you anywhere. But when you assign her to somebody, this is Kiki Smith, who she connects with and there's a heart to heart, you get brilliance. Like, I love this picture. It's out of focus, it's a little blue. All those kind of rule breaking elements of it make it a great, great picture. You know, it, it, she, her pictures breathe more than just about anybody's. Like, they're so there. This is Katie Grant, and it was a cover story on poverty in America. We set out to find poverty in places that are normally synonymous with wealth. This is a little girl living in Woodstock, New York. And here, the idea was rather than the classic treatment one would generally connect with poverty to have Katie with the large camera do something else and she was did beautiful pictures where she said you know I wasn't trying to make a picture of poverty I was trying to make a very specific picture of this girl of her and of course that treatment delivers like a kind of clarity and specificity that was a very memorable Alex Prager who probably some of you know is a rising star in art world right now doing beautiful sort of cinematic highly fictionalized uh, inspired by the <coughs> film's pictures. We hired her last year to do the Oscars portfolio. In recent years, we've been uh, doing a portfolio of the actors who we think gave the best performances of the year. We get it all done long before the Oscars, well, not long before, but we're already late on this year's, but we, we try to uh, get way out ahead so that we come out with it pegged to the Oscars. And here, great collaboration in the brainstorming with Hugo and the team. Rem Duplessis, the design director, said, why don't we do villains? I thought that seems like a perfect thing for Alex. And we then reached out to the, the actors and it was fabulous. In some cases, we, we did tons of research and brainstorming and filled literally the walls with all sorts of references from films. And sometimes we cast the actors and sometimes the actors came up with their own. So Brad Pitt, Mia Wasikowski playing, this was Alex's idea, this kind of crazed, sexy woman who smashes by the end, uh, all of these had videos. Because now when we do this, we commission original videos. So in this case, Alex directed the videos as well as made the pictures. So they're extraordinary short, like one minute videos. And by the end of this one, she had destroyed all the mirrors in that room, like almost a hall of mirrors. Gary Oldman said he chose his own. He wanted to do the dummy in a weird movie from the 70s, Magic. And his, his video is absolutely brilliant. It's crazy good. 
Viola Davis, uh, Alex, we had the idea, oh, we, everybody had the idea, let's do something off Nurse Ratchet. So Nurse Ratchet, like just, there were certain villains that have such a hold on the culture, they just automatically leapt into our roundup. And then Alex brought to it, let's have thousands of these little red uh, ladybugs and have the ladybugs crawling around, which that's where the artist comes in. It would never have occurred to me to do that. George Clooney himself said he wanted to do Captain Bly from Mutiny on the Bounty which of course he just can't be sinister. So it, no matter how, it was, just, it was just funny, but it was great. And then just uh, getting near the end, I wanted to show Lee Friedlander. And this one for me is that wonderful uh, bringing outsider's eyes to an insider subject. This was a fashion world. Lee had said to me, if I could ever get him backstage at the fashion shows, he'd be interested. So I did, and we did the shows in New York. He did about 10 of them that week. It was fabulous. Of course, he wasn't interested in the style. Again, what was wonderful for our magazine was, was a whole other take. He was interested in the workers, because that's an ongoing theme in his work for decades now. So the hairdressers, the nails people, the dressers, the, you know, the stylists. There's a mob scene backstage. So he brought this just wonderful rendering of what it's like in that world. And he was completely fresh eyes. At one point, Anna Wintour walked in the room, and the seas parted. And he said to me, who's that? Like, he, just, <laughs> he had no idea. But the pictures were great. And then this leads me now in tape on the, this is by Larry Tal, what I also think of as an example of extraordinary seeing, the kind of eyes like Lee Friedlander has organizing chaos. Larry Tal brings a quieter look. So when we worked on this Times Square photo issue, 15 years ago, I sent him to Port Authority. He spent a week, and that was the holding room where the Port Authority police would keep the people who'd been arrested every day. And from years of sitting there uh, handcuffed to those things, they obviously left their marks. And I just, to, for me, it's always about keeping your eyes open and missing nothing. The cover by Jack Pearson, wonderful, romantic, beautiful Pearson-esque image. Coincidentally, P.L. de Corsia at that time was working on that series where he was popping uh, the lights in to uh, bystanders who, who didn't realize they were walking into his light. And this, of course, is unbelievable. That's 42nd Street. Lars Tunbork, I brought from Stockholm, again, wanting to get those foreign eyes on something so they see it clearly, because sometimes it's hard to do your own hometown. And this is the, for me, like if you see something photographically, you want to make a picture. Make it the world changes. That's 42nd and 8th Avenue. Nothing of that exists. It's completely gone. And of course, he took this extraordinarily real thing and just through the seeing of it, no manipulation at all, but his mind, it becomes like a Mondrian. It's like uh, he said it made him think of Edward Hopper because he shot it on a Sunday morning. The city was quiet and those beautiful fields of color I love. And it takes me now to one of my all time favorite pictures in the magazine. Abe knows this. I'm not going to tell the story because I want you to, but this was the picture he made for the Times Square issue. Are there any questions just while you switch over? Because if people want, we're a small enough group. That's it. Um, fabulous, fabulous presentation. Um, so you uh, you had shown the picture of the uh, photograph of the good sex um, yes. cover, and you talked about the 17 year old talented young person. How do, how do people just get access to you? How do you find, besides everyone who's famous, how does somebody who is, you know, a photographer is working on their own? How, it's how ba a little bit of everything. Uh, she, oh, she asked, for example, in the case of Olivia B., the teenager who did the pictures for the cover story on, on teenagers and sex, how the photographers, how do I find them? Like, how do they... Get, get connect with the magazine. A little bit of everything. Email, number one for sure these days. People send emails all the time. So sometimes they'll send a link to their website. Sometimes they'll send the actual story. The secret with email is send it in whatever is the fastest way to see it because so much comes in. So like it, it just send it so it's very easy to open it up. So lots of stuff comes in and there have been a number like with the look section, a number of assignments were made to photographers who I hadn't known before, but they either pitch a good idea or, again, sometimes they might have fin completed it. If it's a completed body of work, it has to be unpublished. Uh, it, sometimes it's recommendations. So in the case of Olivia B., I think, and I don't remember for sure, I think the first I'd heard of her 
was there's a uh, somebody a, oh what's it somebody I know had said you should be looking at this work, and she already got had really good website like she was so confident it's very unusual someone so young that she'd been putting her work up online. I can't remember like the first seeing it, and then when this story came up. Somebody else, another member of the photo department had also known of her, Amy Kellner, somebody I just recently hired a picture at her, and she had suggested her for this. I was like, my God, that's great. I mean, to give credit, because I had already been thinking about her. You know what it was? I think Gina Martin, who's a picture editor at National Geographic magazine, was the first in, person who first told me about her work. Pretty sure I have that right. I mean, I just look at so much. Sometimes I can't remember, but it's just getting it there. You know, the best way is email, only in the sense that it's just, that's our lives. There's no, you know, that's the way. Um, so, I, I, I should also maybe begin by, by saying that it's, um, it's such an honor to be here with Kathy because I, I'm a big groupie of hers. I think what she does is uh, no one that I know of has done and keeps doing what she does, which is to look at the world and what's interesting about news and uh, things that matter and then somehow finding a bridge to people who are doing interesting work in the arts or documentary, it's, um, it's, it's conjuring up a thing that is um, it's all her talent. So I am um, really sort of awed by, by what you do. So and, um, and also when she says, someone says, yeah, sure, I'll do it. No, when the New York Times calls you and says, we want to do a magazine thing, y you just say, when? <laughs> y you don't say, well, I don't know, I'm busy. Uh, so she's being very kind of modest uh, about it. Um, in 1996, I got a call from Kathy about this issue of the, the Times Square. And um, I should tell you that in 1996, I was somewhat depressed. Uh, I was in a slump. I had just had... Uh, stent surgery and uh, my mortality was mm, feeling kind of you know on the edge and I was not at the best place in, in life then I got this call and I I'm not saying I'm alive here because of her but um, it, it the the suggestion of making a picture in Times Square really did blossom me it was a very wonderful invitation and I'm, I'll always be grateful for her, um, to her for, for inviting me. So j just to m prove the point, when the pictures come from nothing, they, they come from a lot. So I want to show you a little bit of uh, some background that when Kathy asked me what, you know, to do something in Times Square, all kinds of things were triggering my brain, including my own history. This is uh, 1962. In New York City, um, my myself, my sister, my mother, and a cousin, we were young refugees, Cuban refugees, in New York City. And Times Square was funky. It was, um, but we loved it. So my first impressions of America were Times Square. So very mm, uh, apropos. Um, and then uh, art backgrounds. Stuart Davis is one of my favorite American artists. And I've always loved this American cubism. Um, and it, it felt to me that mm, Times Square feels like a Stuart Davis uh, painting. Um, mostly fun, not about, um, you know, terrible things, but um, just the way that things inside and outside mix. And of course, uh, Broadway boogie woogie, I mean, um, if there's one painting that suggests what you know artists do with a situation, it's this one by Mondrian. But maybe mostly the beginning of photography. Uh, this is a Daguerre photograph early on, a uh, Parisian boulevard, and it's a long exposure, perhaps several minutes long. The film was um, was very slow then, so the only person appearing is a guy getting his shoe shine. Everything else, cars and not cars, but horses and blurred. So not that this explains my picture, 
but all those things sort of kicked into place. Uh, so um, it was a lot of fun to make it, and um, and of course the New York Times, they're so good that I'm in Brookline, Massachusetts, and I'm the next day I get a FedEx with pictures from various hotels <laughs> from Windows. I mean, it's the only way to work, um, and it was it was really interesting to identify what hotel might be the best. Um, so this is 1997. Um, I know two years ago I went back to the same room, and of course it's not the same Times Square anymore. It's um, I really wanted maybe I'll do this in another ten years, um, but the idea of change. Um, is important in my work and uh, important um, just for the continuity of, of the project. Uh, so I want to show you some other pictures that I've made f uh, for the New York Times. Uh, I, I love opera and I've always been kind of a groupie of opera and I wanted to get backstage and see, you know, see the thing. Uh, so I convinced um, uh, Kathy that maybe photographs from the background of opera could be interesting. So it was just fun to go to departments and say, can I see some dresses? Um, and, and make a kind of a, a new operatic visual sense of what I saw. Here's another, this is from La Traviata. So to, to have um, the power to say, you know, open the box and what's in there? And, and people were fine, you know, Kathy said fine, so do it. This is uh, sets for um, full staff, but of course they're just <laughs> in the back room, so it's a new full staff. <laughs> this is uh, a set from Carmen. Uh, I was on the main stage, I think two hours before the opening, and it just felt really wonderful to be at that great stage and um, to think that such magic happens with these cutouts. And certain mannequins are fitted or are made to fit certain sopranos. <laughs> Let's just say it. <laughs> and I love the, the idea that a kind of a magic make-believe happens on stage. And, and we believe it, even though it's quite uh, cartoonish sometimes. There's a sense of it being transportative like this uh, set from Romeo and Juliet, which is the idea of perspective and illusion and uh, mystery was all right there waiting to be energized for the, for the opera. Then um, I think the last thing I did for them was this amazing cello, which is an extraordinary, extraordinary cello. I think it was sold for seven or eight million dollars. Um, and in Boston, and I had the owner um, hang it <laughs> from a s little string. Uh, he, he was a little nervous uh, because I wanted it to be kind of floating. This is a little bit of an homage to Duchamp. Um, so um, he was waiting to catch it in case, um, but it felt like a, a kind of a, a retelling of you know a flatness that the shell doesn't have, um, sort of combining with the volume of it. And this is the back of it. It's a very beautiful instrument. And apparently whoever bought it gave it to a young student in Canada to play, which is wonderful. It's not hidden somewhere in some, um, you know, stockbroker's locker. <laughs> you, you know where I'm coming from, all these comments, right? Um, so uh, this is uh, other pictures that I've been in New York City, just to keep the New York City theme alive, some early camera obscuras. Uh, New York is always, because I grew up in it, uh, it's always inspired me. So um, the Empire State Building, a large room looking at Manhattan. This is my family again in 1963 um, with, I've got this cool sweater. Uh, we got our clothing from Catholic, Catholic charities. So whatever came that week, that's what we wore. 
But I'm showing this picture because back there in that arrow is the plaza. <laughs> and to us, the plaza was 5,000 miles away. Um, so I love the idea of, of someone young arriving in New York being kind of aw awed by the whole craziness of the city. Um, anyway, I got um, access to a very nice room looking at Center Park. Uh, and I made some pictures in it. So this is summer, fall, and spring. And I'm waiting for winter. W we didn't have winter last year uh, in New York. Uh, so I'm, I'm waiting to do the next one. And this is another series from Manhattan, uh, from of the Manhattan Bridge inside a room. Morning, afternoon. So clearly, I, I'm in love with New York in all kinds of emotional ways. And um, so it's, it's part of my blood. Uh, I want to just end with a couple of n new works. I've been tra trying to transfer the idea of camera obscura onto the ground. Um, sort of, this is an early camera obscura, portable camera obscura that people like Fox Talbot, inventors of photographer, the inventor of photographer, used to make pictures. It was a way of narrating the world. The lens brought an image onto the glass um, and a piece of tracing paper would be put on it and in fact you could draw mountains or f rivers or whatever. This is an artist using such box. Th these boxes existed before photography was invented, which is a very interesting idea. Um, these boxes led some people to make these very funky tents um, it looks very odd, but it's, it's actually u useful. This periscope type optic allowed um, nearby landscapes to project themselves onto a piece of paper, which again, you could trace. So I thought it would be, maybe, maybe I can do that too. You know, instead of being stuck in some room, I can go to the desert and, and make a kind of a, a portable scene. So, um, and th this is sort of the schematic of it. It's a, a large tripod with a periscope and a camera inside. The nice thing is you can bring it anywhere. Uh, not to uh, Fort Knox, perhaps, but... Um, and this is a, a very short video of our first setup in West Texas. It felt very 19th century because it was uh, a lot of work. Someone in, uh, it commissioned me to do some work in, in that area, Big Bend National Park. So that tent was looking at this landscape. Um, and that's the picture that came out of it. So this, this marriage of a landscape outside and the ground itself, that specific ground combining together, felt to me like a new way of of envisioning something that, you know, has been seen for a long time. Uh, this is in Maine, um, sort of s the end of spring, dead grass. Recent trip to Yellowstone, uh, wonderful picture by William Henry Jackson, you know, one of the first photographers to deal with it. Um, this is <laughs> us <laughs> in the tent. So the idea was really of, of having a foot in the 19th century and something, because I'm now using a digital camera inside the tent and having very new technology combined under this tent felt very exciting. So this is the picture that came out. So now moments are, I I'm able to capture moments and clouds and things like that. Uh, a couple of New York City tents on rooftops this is on Madison Avenue with a pebbly roof. They do look like the end of New York. Uh, oh, sorry. It's an apocalyptic kind of feeling to them. And this is on a rooftop on the Manhattan side of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, so whatever the ground is becomes part of uh, the meaning of the surface, um, which in a way, it. I think that it makes me sort of come out as a painter in a way, you know, something that I've, I can never do, but it, it suggests painterliness. Uh, recent pictures in Yosemite, 
And of course, Carlton Watkins, one of my heroes, one of the great American artists, uh, photographed sort of the best pictures in this uh, place. And these are my homages to that world. And, um, and I think also maybe suggesting, I hope, that what we think is already done as a, la as a subject could be reinvented. And, and this is something that Kathy, in a way, does constantly. There's a certain revisiting of topics that get shown in fresh new ways through her eye and through the collaboration of the artists. This is um, our tent in, um, uh, this is uh, Cathedral Rock, a very famous site. And the Grand Canyon, our tent is right on the edge of it. And I'll finish with some new constructions I've been making. I've been fooling around with paper uh, from Piranesi and people like that. So making new creations out of Piranesi's prisons, like collage. Maybe this is what New York will look like eventually, who knows? And making large, invented, you know, metropolises. Uh, and weird stuff with paper. This is my self-portrait. Don't ask me why I did it. Uh, um, just another way to use paper, which is uh, my muse. Paper has been so important to me in many ways that I thought, okay, maybe I can be become a paper self. Um, and then I'm going to end with four pictures I just made last week. Of I've been making photograms. And photographs are the, the simplest way of making a picture, which is typically a piece of paper, photographic paper in the dark room. You put something on it, like your hand. You shine light through on it. And when you develop it, you get a white hand. It's very simple and very wonderful and very elemental. I've been taking film, f large format film, like 8 by 10 film, and doing spraying water on it or scratching it or s cutting it doing things on the very film itself so that it becomes something I could enlarge. So these are four pictures I've just made of water and salt. I, it, it seems like I'm 2001 or something. Um, they're, they're totally weird fabrications, but they're, they're really interesting to me. This is just water on the surface of film. But the description is really quite gorgeous. It feels like um, a time traveler. And this is film that has been cut. The film itself is cut and the flap moved. And then it's just flashlight lighting it. So it's the film itself that's been scratched and cut that is providing the subject. It's a very interesting, albeit new world that I'm in. But I'm hoping to do more. I'm going to end with a portrait of my wife that I just made uh, out of water. So that's all I got for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I, I was supposed to have a conversation, Kathy and I, but maybe uh, part of it could be questions or uh, th this is fresh territory. <laughs> Well, maybe I'll ask one question. So the work's gotten a lot more abstract. Maybe say something more about that. Like, does, does that consciously happen? How, did you, how are you making that evolution to well, this abstractor place? Th that's, it's a good way of putting it. Uh, as I'm making more of these tent pictures, the surface itself, the patina of, of the surface, has become more uh, alluring to me. S and it makes me remind you of painting. And not all of it is conventional painting, it's abstractions, which who I, l I love uh, abstract uh, contemporary world. So um, it is turning a little bit into a, a very abstract world that I don't know how it came about. But I hope to still have a foot in the world by having my wife kind of show up. <laughs> uh, but 
I, I, I check this out in 10 years and we'll see, you know. Um, I don't know why, but it's happening. Wonderful. Are there questions? Anybody at all? Or Go ahead. Okay, the paper image of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so you said at the time that uh, paper is kind of your muse. Mm -hmm. And how is that? And how does that show up in your work? In what way? Oh, I, I haven't shown a lot of it. Uh, but I've photographed books for many years. And money. And maps. Uh, so it's sort of symbolic paper. Paper becoming something else has been an obsession of mine for many years. In fact, I've, I've got, s sometimes I, look, I get the New York Times. That, oh, I do get it every day. And I'm always tempted to do Paper something. Version? <laughs> <laughs> I tend to try to get a, a picture of the New York Times, you know, because the paper is so beautiful. And uh, unfortunately, it's something that maybe, I don't know. You get a picture of the Times every day you photograph? No, I oh. try to. I really? tried to. Yeah, but it, mm, wow. not for consumption. Sorry. But that's interesting, <laughs> though. Just sitting there, one copy? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. This sounds like a very interesting <laughs> no, project. No. <laughs> <laughs> he just mentions he's been photographing <laughs> the New York Times every day. I love it. No, sometimes when wow. mistakes, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah. I love it. You know, Not that the New York Times makes mistakes, you know. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Kathy, um, because I don't know how she is even here, because she should be in the office, kind of <laughs> running. How far ahead, and I often wonder about this, how many weeks in advance are you thinking about stuff? And do some things happen suddenly, quickly, like, oh no, we're changing. It's a little bit of everything, exactly. So some big projects we might start months before. Like literally right now, one of the emails this morning I had is related to the Oscars portfolio for this year. So that's going to run in December probably. You know, sometimes we've done them in January. So that's, uh, it's not launched, but it, you know, that's something we'd be launching now. But on the other hand, sometimes something can go on the schedule on Thursday or Friday that maybe we didn't anticipate and we have to move on it very, very quickly. So it's all over. So some are done within days and some are done with months of planning. I would say more often it's, you know, we've, we have several weeks at least. But I, that I each is its own story. And the reason I ask is because I know that you're conscious of uh, uh, events in the world. And, and sometimes great big events happen all of a sudden and how does your big, big machine <laughs> well, deal with that? The, but the thing that makes the magazine different is we work with your reproduction. So we go on press a minimum of 10 days before we come out. Certain pages have to, sh we have to meet a quota every day. But the issue that we finished shipping yesterday is not this Sunday's magazine. It's next Sunday's. And that's always the case. They, the gravure presses, that takes that long to run them. So that means we can't react off the news, the immediate news, yeah. but we still have to be newsworthy. Yeah. Clearly, you've got to be writing about things that are current. So it's either trying to get ahead of something, mm -hmm. where we try to come up with an idea pegged to what we know is coming. Lots of things you realize are coming, whether it's the conventions, the political conventions, the election, the, the, the you know, Olympics or something. But then lots of stories break. And that, you know, but if, if something's going on, hopefully we're thinking about it, you know, but yeah. the news can change what we're doing. So sometimes what might happen, maybe we've got a story out of Libya. We've been working on it for months. The writer was commissioned ages ago and some kind of news breaks in Libya that changes the story and it can't run right away or it has to run right away so that we react to the news somewhat, but we not, we can't change something that week because of something that happens yeah. with some exceptions. Like when September 11th happened that day, at Adam Moss was the editor of the magazine, right then and there a decision was made to hold the presses. That was the only time it's really happened wow. that way. And, and we did an issue from top to bottom in several days and went to press with it. But again, it came out a, you know, a week and a half later, but everything was redone. Mm. So that it had to be newsworthy by either anticipating or maybe coming in after others. But it also gives us that freedom where the work is maybe the equivalent of literary writing. You know, the photography, you don't, you don't have to be right on it, but 
and it's nice to sometimes break news. You know, a lot of what we do is addressing things that are the way we live now, that's what we call it. So teaching teenagers sex education or parenting issues or issues regarding health. You know, lots of these things that are in the news play out over a period of time. We just try to be, you know, on topic when people are interested in something. Is the Times has moved into a uh, digital environment? You know, uh, it's, it's web-based. How has that changed? You know, you come from a paper printed background, and how has that changed the way that you, you deal with your subject matter? Well, one of the big ways it's changed is there is a new, there is a new component. So for example, again, to go to the example of the, the Oscars, in addition to figuring out who to do the still photographs, what the concept, the idea for the portfolio will be that year, we, d we commissioned original videos. And I would say the past two years, we did terrific videos, the ones by Alex Prager and the year before by Solvis Sunsbo. Far more of my energy and the photo department's energy, Joanna Milter in the deputy photo editor works closely on this producing them, went to the videos than the stills. Now in both those cases, the videographer was the still photographer, but that won't always be the case. So. That's a huge part of it. I'm on a steep learning curve. I know a lot more still photographers than I do videographers, filmmakers. You know, I'm now having to broaden that looking because that's what photo editors do. So I'm aware all the time of who's good with the short form. You know, clearly when we're saying video, it's short form. It's going to the web, holding your you know, viewer's interest, which means a minute long at most or two minutes. Or So that's the big change, that creatively, it's this fabulous new area to work in. It's thrilling. It's just amazing to me that I have this opportunity, but it, it means stepping up to the plate and st start figure out how to, to, to do it. And then we also do small, you know, we do slideshows. Occasionally, if we have a good photo story, we'll have some narration that goes with it, sometimes the photographer's voice, sometimes the subject's voices. We don't do that for everything, but there's always that question on the table now. What's the web component? Is there a web component? Um, is there something we should be doing on the web as well as the printed version? And it's shifting. You know, it's not, it's obvious. I mean, more time, more readers, they're going to the web and not the paper version. So you start to realize the importance of it. One of the gifts of it is, let's say we have a photographer do an incredible shoot and it's a story that unfolds through a number of pictures. By definition, the paper is finite. Maybe we have six pages, maybe eight. Maybe it's five photos, six photos. One of the gifts of the web is you can run 12, you can run 20. And I mean that. It's so nice now to not have the heartbreak of not being able to play some of the best pictures because we just don't have those pages. And to know that not only will they be on the web, but a lot more readers are seeing the web version than are seeing the paper version. So I, I find that fascinating still that... But are you are changed so dramatically. Are you editing then for both uh, formats? Oh, sure. So oh. It, we're working, let's say, the individual photo editor who's on a story and me working together. You mi we might be doing the edit for the paper version, which would, you know, you're choosing your best, your best cover. If it's a cover story, your best opener. You, you know, the sequencing is wonderful. That we love that with their, our extraordinary designers and Rem Duplessis' team. It's, you know, the layout is such a part of it. But we're also aware of the fact that there might be this other piece, the slideshow, and how do we want to present that. The slideshows are very successful. We find, you know, readers like to be interactive. If they can press on something and control the time spent, that's important. And same thing with the videos. I really believe in this. I mean, there might be differences of opinion, but if you have very short videos, let's say with the Oscars, if you do 12 actors, let's say, if you put up 12 thumbnails and each is a one minute video or 50 seconds, whatever, and the viewer can choose which one, that, that's, that's sticky. That keeps them there and they move amongst them. Oh, I'm gonna look at Brad Pitt or I'm gonna look at this or that. So I just throw that out there for anybody here who are photographers, videographers. Mm. That is a fascinating new form and it is about speed and interaction. The longer videos, I think you has gotta be incredible to keep people watching. I mean, I, I, you know, people know this, but I think it's just good to remind ourselves because it, it, it's a very unique, it is the form. It's, it's get in there, make something happen quickly, you know. So do you think that it's almost analogous to 10 years ago saying, oh, we'll never do digital. You know, we're stuck on film, only shooting film. 
And if you'd made that decision 10 years ago, you're pretty much lost now. And so do you think it's a similar thing to being a still photographer, having to work yourself into, oh. into video going forward? Well, that's a really good question. I don't think that still photography will disappear in the way that your first analogy, yes, if you've decided you will only shoot on film, you're in trouble. If it was Kodachrome, it's gone. If it's Polaroid, it's not the same. So you, you've worked yourself into a hole that's difficult. Will there always be film? Yes, but it's becoming more of a specialized thing and a boutique thing, and, and you limit opportunities if you stick with film. If you're Lee Friedlander, you can shoot film. Nobody's expecting him to switch at this point in his career. But how many... He's you know, old. He's old. It's like, exactly. But, you know, we have the privilege at the magazine. We can actually, on our deadlines, handle that for certain stories. If it's a story out of Afghanistan, and we really do want to get those pictures in quickly because maybe we're closing it next week, you have to be digital. But to get back to your question, I don't think stills will disappear, but I think you become a lot more valuable to a magazine if you're also a videographer. Yes. For sure, because there are definitely now moments where picture editors, we are saying to ourselves, geez, on this story, it would be great if I could send someone who not only will do the stills, but also the video. But then here's the tricky part. Creatively, when stories unfold quickly, maybe it's too much to ask one person. So it's, that's a constant discussion with myself and the photographer. So sometimes a photographer might want to do both. Lindsay Adario, when she goes to Darfur, or she does something on maternal mortality, she did, or let's say she's doing something in Afghanistan, she's stepping into f to video, and she likes to do a, sh a video or sh record voices and have them run with her still pictures. So photographers recognize they, particularly if you're documentarians and you're going to a place like Af Afghanistan, it really helps if you can shoot some of the video because it's here and it's part of it. And to be honest, at this point, you'd be crazy to miss some of the voices. That practical reality of if you have four days to shoot a story and it's going to be all consuming to make the best possible still photos, maybe you don't want to be distracted by the video also. So that's just every single time a question. Is it going to be too much of a distraction and it, you don't want to affect the quality of the stills? On the other hand, budgets being budgets, reality being reality, there's sometimes something to be said for when we, just to back up the um, Second Avenue tunnel, the subway, you know, putting in the subway there, I split the ticket. So Richard Barnes did the stills, and then we hired Jacob Krupnik, a great videographer, to do the video. Because it, there's no way that Richard could be down there with the tripod, setting that up, doing pictures, and they were, or the access was actually limited. It was frustrating, because if I were the MTA in New York, I would open that up to New York Times. If we came and said, we're sending a great photographer and a great videographer, I'd say, you, you can come every single night for three weeks. They didn't. What they basically said was, and I'm grateful for the access we got, you can come on this night for two hours, this night for two hours, which maybe he stretched it to three. This night, I can't remember if it was, I think it was all total four trips of about two hours, and that goes fast when you're yeah. down there. There's no way one man or woman could do both. So then Jacob did his own thing, which also called into, he brought in, the head of the project and had wonderful quotes from him. The guy's a bit of a character. He kind of went into a whole other direction. So sometimes the video might be entirely different. Same subject, whole other story that you're telling. So they're all different, but it really is nice if somebody's developing both because you just have more a shot at certain assignments. Um, you've alluded to the paper as a muse of yours. Can you elaborate some on the literary influences on your, on your process? Um, what's your relationship to books as objects? How do you read? How do you reread? Your, your, your photographs I'm familiar with are so evocative of, of, the, of a, a literary and imaginative world that I would just curious to... Well, I mean, I, I love reading, uh, but I think I, I came to the U.S. in 62 not, not speaking Eng English, and so I had a, a great teacher in high school who taught me how to read, basically, by reading Hemingway. So somehow I think the, the idea of learning English and becoming an American and becoming something was fused with the idea of books being, a, I don't know, an icon or something. So I've always loved the, the smells and the idea of books, you know, giving sort of messages from elsewhere. So it's very important to me. 
um, and I, I do read a lot. Although, uh, full con you know, confession here, I, I read on a Kindle now, so, uh -huh. um, so that smell is gone, <laughs> most of it anyway. Do you get ideas for images while you're reading? Do you ever, like, while you're, or, or when you're thinking of a story that you've read, do you, does an image come to mind that you then try to create or no? No, ideas just, I mean, if I'm in a room thinking or something, just, uh, they just pop in, like the, my, my wife or something. <laughs> you know, how do I make her be lunar or something? I don't know, stuff like that. No, I'm, I'm, I don't think it, it's directly like that, I, I, but I do love to read. Um, and um, and reading is what really made me succeed in this in the in the U.S. I mean, it helped to um, to be able to converse. Um, it's such a, a huge element of, of becoming part of a culture that uh, it's so important. How do you see the impact of social media on the you know the how do you see the impact of social media on your work with the magazine and everything? I mean, it's, I, I, from a consumer side, I mean, I, I'm exposed to a lot more now than I've ever been able to be exposed to. I mean, uh, but so how, from your side, how is that impacting your, your business? Well, it's so important to what we do, and uh, it's one of my weak links. Like, I have got to get better at it. I just got, went on Facebook recently and Twitter, it's, which is sad. <laughs> but the editor of the, I, I did it, I took the leap. But the editor of the magazine, Hugo Lindgren, feels strongly that all the editors should be tweeting regularly. We've got to be in that world, and many of them are. It's, it's how the message gets out. It's so important. The hard part is, uh, honestly, a little, an old timer like me, I have to just get into the rhythm. And that, like you say, there's such a profusion of it. I, it just me keeping, if you knew the amount of emails I got a day, it's crazy, and keeping up with that. But then to have like the Twitter stream running, and it, I, I can't, it's, it's just, a, I don't know how to keep it all going, but it's clearly important. You, you get ideas. I mean, one of the great things with the social media for us is sometimes we find out about a photographer in a place or a body of work we might not know of that we then benefit from and we publish it, you know, it was so great when, I think it was Stacy who first found out that Andrew Moore had this work about to be published out of Cuba and we were struggling, we weren't getting a photographer in there. So it's a help that way, it's a constant thing and it's nice to, when we have something great, it's nice to be able to put a link and say, hey, take a look at the look pages this week, we've got a terrific series of pictures by so and so. So it's helpful for us because there, there's so much all the time demanding attention. It's just one more way to say to people, we think this is special. You know, so it's, it's really promoting yourself. But I would be kidding you if I, I don't understand it. It's one of the things I just constantly have to work at, that I have to get better at it. I mean, my poor husband hears it. I gotta, get, I gotta do more <laughs> on Facebook. I gotta like, I'm doing it now, but it's hard. I, and it's also hard because I, you like this human connection. It's nice, we're here in person, or you know, not just, so much of what we do is from afar and electronic. I like to have the chance to, but the good news is it connects you to people all over the place and that's a good thing. Well, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Abe, so much for everything. Um, I hope everyone will uh, come stop by the Aperture booth and see the wonderful book that Kathy edited for us and features uh, Abe's, some of Abe's photographs uh, for the New York Times Magazine. And she'll do a book side. And so will you, I hope. <laughs> Thank you.